Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name is uh, Sebastian Betarmi. I'm an Associate Professor of Finance at the Dis Hotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. Today is a great pleasure to welcome um, Rahil Jandwa from CPP Investments. Uh, this is the fourth session of our speaker series leading up to the grand finale of the MIPC 2020 Challenge. The topic today is an important topic. It is how to make a large portfolio of an institutional fund more efficient by integrating technological innovation. Uh, for this uh, session, uh, our moderator is going to be Ferhat Gerby. Uh, Ferhat is a student at McGill doing his Bachelor of Commerce with a major in mathematics, a minor in economics. Ferhat is a member of the MIPC 2020 organizing team. Ferhat, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Professor Bittami. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Frat, and I'm on the MIPC team. I'll be moderating today's presentation. And to be honest, I'm really excited. Uh, we're talking about something that's very interesting, very timely. So technological, technological change in pension uh, funds. And I don't want to use the word perfect, but we have a very suitable uh, speaker today for this, Mr. Rihel Janjua, who is Director of Innovations uh, at CPP Investments. For those who don't know CPP Investments, it it's an investment management company. Uh, they're working alongside the Canadian pension plan to pay benefits to over 20 million uh, Canadians. They really have offices around the world and they're dealing with a very uh, diverse and wide types of uh, assets. Mr. Janjua uh, is currently leading a team there where they're really combining data and new tech to be able to maximize uh, the returns of their portfolio without adding, adding any more risk to, to it. He's had really an impressive professional career leading uh, analytics at Google Canada. He worked at PCT, he worked in engineering before. I mean, he's seen and was part of the, the, of the tech change we'll be uh, talking about today. So just before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that following Mr. Janjua's presentation, we'll have a Q&A uh, period. So you can type your questions during the presentation and during the Q&A period. They'll be anonymous and we'll answer them uh, then. So without further ado, Mr. Janjo, I'll leave it to you. All right, thank you for having the team for having me. It's quite exciting to be here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Rahil and I'm here to talk about uh, a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, which combines two things I'm most passionate about, finance and technology, and how can you use that for the benefit of the millions of Canadians who are served by CPP investments. Um, I'll, you know, uh, you know, Farhad already said some uh, brief words about my background, but really, you know, uh, just, just to give you guys a quick sense of who I am. Uh, I've been at CPP investments for over a year. And, uh, you know, we are focused at CPP Investments. I had our innovation group and we are focused on figuring out what is the best way to use data as well as technology innovations such as machine learning um, and others to maximize the return of our portfolio without undue risk of loss. We are focused on multiple set of asset classes across both the private and the public side, um, equities, credit, macros and others. And, you know, we really trying to see, you know, how can we future proof our business, but also, you know, ultimately do something that will, you know, that will enhance or accelerate our mandate, which is to pay uh, pension benefits to, you know, the 20 million or so Canadian contributors who contribute to us. Um, prior to CPPA investments, I, I led analytics at Google Canada. I also worked at BCG and, you know, uh, even though I got an MBA, I, I think of myself as, as an engineer at heart. So, uh, you know, I did my undergrad in engineering. Um, other than that, outside of work, I, I'm, a, I'm a proud father of three young kids and an avid traveler. I'm not necessarily traveling right now, as, as, as you all can probably appreciate. Uh, but, you know, anytime I'm not spending at work, I'm always trying to spend time with my, with my kids. Uh, you know, with that, I'll jump into like what we're planning to cover today. So I will take a few minutes just to give you all an overview of what CPP Investments is and what we do. I'm going to assume that some people are already familiar, some people might not be. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to level set. And then I will use a few examples to illustrate how uh, we're thinking about data and technology innovation at CPP Investments. This is just like, uh, you know, just some representative examples. 
to give you an idea of how we are thinking about it uh, and you know and then you know hoping to have a very open uh, and robust q and a session so you know if you have any questions you know i'll be i'll be glad to have a discussion so you know uh, definitely want to leave some time uh, for those in the end um, starting with the overview of cpp investments so cpp investments um, as for half pointed out is a global investment management organization and we and our we are, we, we our specific mandate is to invest the Canada Pension Plan funds that are not needed currently to pay pension, disability, and survivor benefits to our contributors. We are an independent organization, so we're not a crown organization. We are an independent arm's length organization. And really, you know, our, you know, what we're trying to do is to allow the 20 million Canadian contributors who contribute to, you know, to, to CPP you know, just give them a just give them a platform to build uh, their financial security in retirement. Um, we have, you know, we so th you know there are all sorts of uh, I guess investment management firms out there, and everyone has their own unique advantages and and you know and an operating model. For CPPIB, you know, there are a few unique things are that actually are very beneficial for us is the scale and certainty of our assets. Uh, what, what we mean by that is that, you know, uh, you know, we are only one of the few investors in the world that can do unique transact transactions anywhere in the world and significant in size. And so we often end up being, you know, one of the first investors people call into a situation. Right. Uh, we also have certainty of assets in the sense that we know who the current contributors are, and we sort of have a sense of what the what those future inflows of cash would look like. Um, you know, you know, so, so the, the scale and the certainty combined together actually give us a very unique advantage. And we obviously have a very long term focus. Or like a recent report by the Chief Actuary of Canada said that you know the CPP has seventy five plus years of sustainability. So you know, com combine all of that, we take a very long term view of uh our investments and that means we can be very patient and flexible investors and you know we don't necessarily have to worry about some of the short-term things that other investors have to worry about a quick overview of our performance uh over the last five to ten year time period so ever since um you know um oh, ever since the last 10 years the cpp investments uh have added uh, 235 billion Canadian dollars as net income after all investment costs have been accounted for. Uh, our you know five-year annualized rate of return has been around eight percent, and a ten-year annualized rate of return has been ten percent. So again, these are these are numbers which we are very proud of. But you know, obviously, this is all backward looking, and you know, our focus now is to keep ensuring that you know we we deliver on these numbers, and in fact, we do do even better. We have offices across the world and, and, and the benefits that I talked about in terms of scale, uh, this our scale and certainty of assets plus the office, the, the office around the world allow us to actually have a really globally diverse portfolio as of, you know, end of March 2020. Um, you can see our exposure to the different places, right? Like 25 percent United States, 25 percent Asia, around 16 percent. Canada and then Europe and, and the UK together are 15 person and and then you know Latin America Australia and a few other places you know make up the rest uh, the fund uh, CPP investments has a 2025 strategy and a roadmap we are working towards and one of the things that as part of that roadmap is that by 2025, we hope to have one third of our investments within an emerging market. So, so this picture that you're seeing is a snapshot as of this March, but you know we hope to have um, an increased focus in emerging markets by you know by by end of 2025. So that was like a really quick overview about about CPP investments. Uh, let's switch gears now to talk about innovation at CPP investments and how, how we think about it. So as you know, as we were thinking of 
actually f- building my team and figuring out my role. And this is actually even before I got to the organization. I was involved in some of these discussions ever since I've come. But like as you know, as as CPP was thinking through things, and we we got we we got the opportunity to do some research as to how others think about it, and the team that was working on this question as to how do you integrate innovation in 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 in, in a pension fund, um, you know, they, they did they did some they, did, they actually did a pretty lengthy study and engagement with outside thought leaders. I, I included a couple of couple of interesting tidbits from that because I thought that's actually very uh, very interesting to set the context of our discussion. So the first one is that innovation is very high on the agenda for everyone. Uh, so everyone wants to be innovative. Everyone's talking about innovation. Everyone wants to be more data driven, use more technology. But but people are a either not sure how to do it, or b even if they are doing something, they're not sure if they're on the right path. So they find it very hard to. Uh, to evaluate whether you know they are successful or not, what's the value of this? So you know, and and this is true across industries. So so this, this is this is a study that was done by BCG, and uh, as you can see, like across industries, everyone thinks innovation is important, but then when it comes to evaluating your success, people are like, oh, maybe we are okay, maybe we are weak, maybe we're strong, but like most people just do, really don't have a good sense of how to evaluate their own success. So. So the one thing that we really took away from this was that we're not going to do innovation for the sake of doing innovation, or we're not going to build this team for the sake of building a team. We have to be really clear about how we evaluate success, and that is one of the first questions we need to answer. Otherwise, you know, what's the point of doing this? We don't want to end up in this situation ourselves. Um, the other interesting tidbit from that study. Uh, that we thought a lot about and I still think a lot about is, you know, innovation is not something, it's not like a silver bullet. It's not like one project. It's not one team. You almost need to have an ecosystem mentality to drive innovation. Like, us, and when I say an ecosystem mentality, what, what I'm really trying to say is there are certain things that need to be true for a company to become innovative. And uh, this slide sort of lays, lay, lays those out across the buckets of innovation strategy, innovation engine, enablers, and capabilities. But you know, if you look at the at the items that are bolded in green, you can think of those as the seven ingredients that matter, that need to be true, or uh, for for a company to actually successfully drive innovation. So starting from the very top, uh, the first one is leadership, like. So the leadership needs to champion innovation, believe in it, and must be able to clearly articulate the goals and the mandate. Then there are priorities and governance, which is around, okay, who's responsible for what? Well, what are we doing? What are the stage gates? And then there are structures around how do we do it, right? Like, And again, depends on what level of aspiration and ambition you have in as an organization. And then you have uh, a bucket of enablers and capabilities. And in this, you have things like process, culture, you know, where people are, uh, you know, not afraid of failure, risk taking, having the right talent, and obviously metrics and incentives, which goes back to what we talked about earlier, right? Like you need to be able to know how to measure your success. Um, so, you know, those are the seven sort of buckets uh, or, or seven sort of things that, that matter if you, you know, if you're trying to, if you're the CEO of a company and you're trying to drive innovation, you kind of need to sort of think about all those things. But I think in my experience, uh, that if I had to pick, I had, if I had to pick, uh, if I had to sort of summarize this further or I had to pick two or three from this, I would rank leadership, culture, and people even higher than, than the others. And, and the reason is, First, you just need smart people or, or people who are, you know, just willing to, you just need the right talent, right? So that's just obvious. Culture is very important because even if you have the right people and you have the right culture of taking risks, speaking up, feeling empowered, being agile, nimble, and all those sort of things, you know, no matter what process you build, no matter what you try, no matter what metrics you have, it's not going to work. And then lastly, you need leadership buy-in because you need the people at the very, very top, the C-suite basically, to be to be innovation champions, they need to they need to they need to champion it really, and not only just say it, but they need to walk the talk and you know uh, encourage failure, encourage risk taking, and encourage uh, you know encourage and articulate the ambition and the vision that is needed to you know 
to to rally the whole organization behind. So, in, like in my opinion, like leadership, culture, and people are the most important things to drive an innovation ecosystem within any organization. So, so, so you know, you know, so, 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 based on this as well as the other point we talked about, you know. CPP Investments came up with its um, innovation, uh, you, you know, innovation commitment, as we call it. Um, and, you know, there are different corporate objectives that we have, but, you know, one of them is the second one is just directly focused on foster a culture that promotes innovation, amb ambition, agility, and inclusiveness. And this is coming from the very top. And uh, everyone at CPPIB, whether it's the CEO or whether it's someone in the frontline teams, is expected to sort of embody and, you know, act and demonstrate uh, demonstrate certain behaviors that help us, you know, get to these corporate objectives. And, and the message is loud and clear, like innovation is everyone's job. It is not the job of one team or the other. We all need to be doing innovation and in our own, you know, in, in our own jobs, in our day to day, or whatever projects we are working on. Um, the other thing, which which is building on the which is the building on the message that is like innovation is everyone's job. The other decision that CPPIB deliberately took it was to, it was it was to say it was. To say, um, um, I'm actually hearing a, some echo. Uh, am I? Is my voice clear? Yeah, I okay. think it is. Oh, okay. Awesome. Sorry, I was just hearing the echo. I wasn't sure uh, if this was me or someone else. Uh, yeah, so I was. what I was trying to say was uh, innovation is everyone's job. And then the other deliberate decision that's, that we made uh, was, as we thought about our innovation strategy and rolling it out, is that we are not going to limit innovation to one particular team. We are going to let like an ecosystem of the uh, ecosystem or you know, that analogy of let a thousand flowers bloom, you know, happen. And therefore, you know, innovation is happening across the fund. And on this page, what what you see are some some examples of the recent developments within the fund that each have its own unique purpose, but together all of them are contributing towards, uh, you know, increasing the innovation uh, across CPPIB. Uh, some of the innovations are incremental, like I think of them as continuous improvement or natural evolution within the department, and some of them are very transformational, and they're fundamentally changing the way we invest and make uh, investment decisions. Uh, I'll give you an example, like for example, we started recently started a venture capital funds program and opened up an office in San Francisco. You know, we have had innovation focused teams within each department. Uh, we have a program that was recently launched to drive strategic technology and data partnerships. So we are investors and we invest in a, you know, a lot of companies across the world, but sometimes, you know, for startups and others, we necessarily don't want to invest, but we want to have some form of strategic partnership, right? So there's a program for that. And then, you know, I'm gonna talk a bit more about my team, which is the Alpha Generation Lab, which was set up last year as a result of, you know, um, all this all this work and the strategy that was laid out for 2025 and, and, and now being implemented. So, uh, and then, you know, there are a few other things as well. I'm going to switch gears now and just go deep into the Alpha Generation Lab, which is my team. And obviously, you know, uh, you know, I'm happy to share more details there, but just just wanted to point out the purpose of walking it through this journey so far was to a obviously tell you how certain decisions were made and b to emphasize a point that you know innovation needs to happen across the enterprise and many teams need to to have at it and you know and you kind of need to take multiple bets to 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 ensure success so let's uh, dive deep into the alpha generation lab which is which is my team so the lab's mandate is to develop and accelerate innovative investment capabilities uh, for CPP investments. Um, what that really means is that, that if you look across any asset class, let's look at public equities, for example, there's an investment life cycle starting from, starting from an opportunity popping up all the way to the diligence and doing the actual transaction or investment and then actually managing that investment after you have completed the transaction. And what the lab is trying to do, they're trying to, we're trying to look at 
the entire investment life cycle across multiple asset classes and see what are the decisions that are being made by human beings right now across the fund. What are those decisions that can be complemented by either technology such as machine learning and or by additional data that investors are typically not using. Um, a simple example could be there are all sorts of credit card panels, other sources of alternative data like, you know, sale receipts, feather data, satellite data, a bunch of things that normally an, inv an investor wouldn't have been using 10, 20 years ago or most investors wouldn't have been using. Is there an opportunity to make that available to investors at the different stages of uh, of the investment life cycle so they can actually incorporate that data and be more data driven. Um, so that's, that's a simple example. The other example is what are some areas where machine learning is just going to outperform human beings, you know, in terms of finding patterns and detecting, you know, patterns in data and things that, you know, a normal investor wouldn't be able to do just like human mind isn't capable of doing. And, and in those situations, how can we, strategically deploy machine learning enabled algorithms to recommend decisions to us. And then obviously still uh, at the end of the day, the investment team still looks at that as one of the inputs along with other things that they have both quantitative and qualitative to make a decision. But the, but but really that is what the lab is trying to do. Find decisions that can be supported by technology or data and actually deploy that. And, and the way we try to do it is we try to partner with different investment departments and we pick an idea uh, with a certain hypothesis and we run a proof of concept to actually test that hypothesis. And in a few months, we try to answer the question whether this works or not. And if it works, great, we scale it. If it doesn't work, we pivot to something else. So how do we, I started talking a bit about this already, but like, how do we think about and evaluate projects that are taken undertaken by, by the lab? So like, we think that in order to generate alpha uh, today and in the future, we need to have one of three things. Either we need to have some sort of unique data or information that no one else has. We need to have access to technology. We talked about that. And we also need to have empirical modeling and prediction techniques. And, and I would put this down as, you know, machine learning skill set or like feature engineering, data engineering, or, you know, any of those skills that are needed to take raw data and and get it and take it to a point where you have an output in terms of a prediction, uh, that or a prediction or a forecast that you could then use an investment decision with. Uh, most of the efforts of the lab right now are concentrating and then building and improving forecasting engines. So what, what a forecasting engine essentially is that we are saying for a certain time horizon, let's say 12 months, or a certain basket of public or private securities, we are trying to forecast certain uh, certain targets, whether it's revenue, EBIT, or any or returns or any of any of those, right? And then we are trying to take different approaches to see how we can get better at it. In some cases, we are finding success. In some cases, we are not finding success, and we're just pivoting. So we, so ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to learn as much as possible you know, in the shortest amount of, amount of time and just either fail fast or scale fast. So you know, th that's really the mantra uh, behind it. And obviously we're trying to incorporate different data sets. We're always on the lookout to find unique sources of data. You know, we're always trying to find the right talent who can you know, work with us, uh, whether it's by joining CPP investments and the lab or just by being an external partner that we can have a strategic relationship with. Um, on this page is, is a simple illustrative example of how we think about new projects and uh, you know really like let's say you're all in let's say you're all sitting at a round table and we're trying to think about building a prediction engine that can predict something that you know let, let's say that can predict something and that, that will help us make money you know through, through the public markets and i'm just going to use a public markets example just because it's easier to explain so so the first question we ask is as an investor if we could have perfect foresight. So if we could just know the future, what key metric would that be? Is that revenue? Is that EBIT? Is that mar gross margin or fee cash flow? Whatever, like any of those. And then, and the answer is normally going to be, oh, you need to have many. But then you realize that actually to forecast one metric over a certain time period is not an easy thing. And you need to know what 
is doable given the data you have, the computing resources you have, the scale you have. There's also the opportunity cost because you just don't have unlimited resources. Plus, in some cases, there are others out there who are doing better than you. So why do you want to like you can't really compete? So you have to do all look at all those trade offs and you need to come up with some metrics or targets, prediction targets that you think are going to give you an edge over everyone else who's trying to do the same thing. And there are a lot of people trying to do this. And then you need to make sure that whatever you pick is actually alpha worthy or like alpha generation has alpha generation potential. Like it has a like scientifically speaking, it has a causal relationship to uh, returns, right? Otherwise, if you pick something that doesn't really drive returns or it's already priced in the wider market or someone else is better at it or any of those situations, it's not worth your time. So once you know, once you establish that metric and we do essentially an exercise to sort of establish that, once you've done that, then the question becomes, okay, if I can figure this out, if I can predict this metric successfully, then how do we invest and how do we, you know, how do we how do we design a portfolio by uh, you know around it? how big that portfolio is, what's the breadth, what's the trading horizon, what, you know, and you then start answering all of those questions around how, when will you buy, when will you exit, and all of those. And if you go through this entire exercise, you end up with a, with like a hypothesis. So, so, and that's how, that's how we start. We write this one pager, that's our hypothesis. And then we go and find the right data, the team, and, and, and we put some structure and process around it, and we run out a proof of concept to see if it works or not. I, I already talked a bit about this, but just just to give you an idea of how the lab is structured and governed at a, at a very high level, it's so like we are responsible, uh, we are accountable, sorry, not responsible, we are sponsored by and accountable to senior management of the firm. So that's like the CEO and the senior managing directors. Uh, so they are involved, which goes back to the point I was making around leadership, like for something like this to be successful, you need buy-in from the very top. So we have that. Then we have a 100% dedicated team whose job is just to innovate and come up with hypotheses and try and rapidly test them. So and it's a cross-functional team of investors, data scientists, and engineers who work together in you know in different pods. And at one time we'd have four or five pods running. Pods is another way of you know calling a project team. Like you can just refer to them as pods. And we try and test our ideas very quickly. And if something works, great, we scale it and we work together with the relevant investment department to embed that in their day-to-day -day decision making. If it doesn't work, that's okay. We move on and we try and you know do something else. Um, the one other thing we are trying to do, so like we started more than a year ago and so far we've had four or five ideas being tested at a time and it's been great, but we need to have uh, we need to have a pipeline of new ideas or hypothesis to test. So, you know, we have developed an internal portal within CTP investments where people can share any ideas that they have and, you know, they can submit that idea, then others can vote on it, comment on it. So think of it as like an internal innovation Reddit that we have built. Uh, it's still in early stages, but it's just one of the ways we are trying to fuel the innovation engine and keep building our pipeline of ideas to test because you know like we, we are a big team of 15 people we constantly need to have things in the pipeline to test um with that i will pause uh you know i, I think you know um we are at the half hour mark right now so uh, you know i think it's a good time to go over any questions you all had I try to keep everything brief and just high level, so at least you have an idea of about the fund, about the journey, about our innovation journey, and what specifically my team is doing. Happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Rahil. Uh, that was great. Um, even I have some questions. So just look at the chat. Um, we do have a few questions. All right, let's start with the first one. So uh, the question is, what type of models are used in uh, the lab in terms of machine learning predictions? So, uh, great question. Um, just, just an acknowledgement, there's only certain information I'm allowed to share. So just with that caveat, I would say we are, if I intentionally made the choice not to be limited by models, whether it's machine learning models or whether it's technology choices, we have a pretty open, 
attitude towards them. We're trying to use a lot of open source technology and libraries and things like that. And but same for models. We are we we are pretty open, and, and uh, you can you, you you can expect that we will be using all sorts of things, whichever whichever makes sense. So we're not constrained by technology or any choices there. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, another question. Um, can the alpha generation lab work for private ma markets where there's obviously less data or is it something more uh, used in public markets? Great question, great question. So that is actually a question we often get asked internally as well. So the answer is yes, there are a few things we are doing already on the private side. Uh, Again, just going back to the framework we have, which is what is the investment life cycle? So on the private side, you obviously have sourcing, origination, diligence, then acquisition or buyout or, or transaction, whatever you want to call it, and then asset management. So there's already another team at CPPID that is focused on value creation or asset management through advanced data analytics and machine learning. So we partner a lot with them in terms of learning and, and we have done we have done joint projects with them as well in terms of like I'll give you an example like one of our we have a very one of our major portfolio companies that is a retailer had a question that we have I don't know like a thousand stores across a certain country uh, we want to open a thousand more which locations should we open those stores in so that is a prediction problem um, you can attempt to answer it in a in a different, in a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, there are many ways to solve that question. The lab, given its unique skill set in machine learning and alternative data, use alternative data and machine learning to do that, right? So, and again, this is something we did jointly with our private equity folks. So, so on the, I guess, the post transaction side, there's actually lots of data, especially if you own the asset, right? On the pre transaction side, it's interesting. You have, there are situations where you just don't have enough data, and that's true. But then the answer is not really to give up on private equity. Like the answer or the approach we are, we are taking is actually there is limited data, which also means that, I mean, that's and that's a problem for everyone. So there's also an opportunity. So what is the PPIB and the lab's data creation strategy? So how can we make sure that there's limited data, but there's more data than we are using right now? So how can we actually just increase the usage of data? And can we also create data? and I, and when I say create data, I mean we have access to to different sources of data, but there's often things you can do by combining data sets and you know whether it's third party internal or or or, or, or like you know from your partner. So how can you actually create data that gives you that unique advantage? So so to, to I guess long winded way of saying to answering the question is that's a great question. It's an ongoing challenge with data on the private equity side. But the answer is not to give up on it, but to figure out how you can bring the unique data to the table and actually have a strategy behind that. I see, I see. It's a clever way to, to go around it. Uh, another question we have. So how long, A, how long does it take to build a successful model? Then B, what's the useful life of the model? How long will it take before it becomes relevant or ineffective in the market? Yeah, great question. I, I think we, Unfortunately, the answer is it depends on, on, on the on the situation. But in our experience, we have had a couple of POCs where it's taken more than a year to actually get to something tangible. Like, I mean, you can build a, a so, so in our experience, normally the thing is the effort is needed to get the right data, organize that data, clean it up, transform it, basically engineer it. And, and before you even get to feature the feature engineering phase of the of the machine learning process, that's already a few months, right? Like you had to get the data, you have to organize it, transform it, all of that. That's that, that's the most resource intensive and time consuming thing. But once you have that figured out, building a model is actually not that hard, and then getting a back test and all of that is, is actually not that hard. So I would say, if, like in our experience, Anywhere between six to twelve months has been, uh, you know, has been the sort of the, the the time range we have looked at in terms of getting something off the ground that is actually useful. And when I say useful, it could be useful that it tells us that <laughs> that we had no skill in this and we should do something else, or it's useful whether it's needing something useful in terms of creating value for the company. So we define useful as anything, right? Like a failure is useful as long as you learn something from it. Uh, and then, how long before it becomes obsolete? Actually, that's that's very interesting. So, and then the answer there is very, very diverse because 
on the public side, actually, it can become obsolete tomorrow. I have no idea, right? It's like because you're on the you're competing with so many different people and you just don't know. On the private side, that's why I feel like the private side opportunity is pretty strong because once you can figure it out, the 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 time it will take for someone else to do that and the, and for it to become obsolete, rather to put it put it better, is actually is actually more. So you can actually leverage it, you know, for a longer period of time. Public side is very hard to predict because it could become obsolete mm-hmm. like tomorrow. So so you use the word useful and obsolete many times. Is there a common metric? to quantify that usefulness or is it something really case by case? Yeah, so for all the work that we do in the alpha generation lab, the, the metric that matters is like you know, how much alpha was produced. So like what were the investment returns and were these investment returns on top of like like, like certain like we are, we already have investing teams across all sorts of asset classes. So we already sort of know what the baseline is. So was there anything additive or not? So that's really the metric that matters. Uh, but obviously that is like a lagging indicator. So uh, this is another thing that we talk a lot about internally, not just within the lab, but across CPKIB. So we always think about lagging and leading indicators when we're talking about innovation. So whether I produced in like something I did or something the team did and we produce enough investment returns or not is a lagging indicator. We'll only know in the very, very end. So it's useful to measure our success in the end, but it's not useful when you're actually building something. So we need to always come up with leading indicators on you know, how we're doing. And the way we try to get around that with those leading, leading indicators is obviously just having milestones in each project, which tell us, are we on the right path or not? And, and if yes, then continue. If no, then just shut this down and do something else because the biggest concern is uh, the opportunity cost because we have a limited number of people and resources and you know both the time and money. So like, why do you want to do something that you know is going to fail, right? So let's just just move on to something else. And, and we set up set up those months. Like I'll give you an example. Like if we are trying to forecast top line revenue for a basket of 500 public traded equities across a certain industry or geography, whatever. Like this is a totally made up example. Uh, we'll do a back test. We'll do a back test, and that will be uh, that will be a good measure of how we are doing. And if there is anything there, then we will only move it out of sample uh, period, and then we'll try and you know scale it gradually. So we'll try to set up uh, milestones um, along the way to just know as soon as possible that we are on the right track. Okay. Now. I see. I see. Uh, just quick heads up. Uh, we'll have again four minutes. We're going to go until forty-five. And we'll try to get as many questions in as possible. Uh, another question we had, I like, I like this one. Uh, so what's the governance and decision-making process uh, to build these models? So in other words, uh, is there like a built-in purpose, uh, corporate mentality for these models? Or is it just a few clever people that want to test their ideas? Yeah, so, so there's a formal governance process in the sense that Let's say we have 10 ideas that we want to work on. We only work on five or four. So how do we pick which one? So obviously, uh, you know, there's multiple people involved, both within the leadership of the lab as well as people outside the fund, like who are interested in getting things, you know, are collaborating upon. But at the end of the day, like the metric that matters is what is the potential impact? So that is what we look at. It's because it's not confirmed yet, but whichever idea has the highest potential impact in terms of creating alpha for the fund, we will prioritize that. And if all the resources are needed for that, and there's only one thing we can do, that's okay. And it's also okay if we fail, but at least we tried to, to solve for the hardest problem. Which is another in, another another interesting thing to keep in mind is that's the whole point of the lab. Like it's it should it, it, like the whole point of the lab is to have these 50 people solve the hardest problems that departments and teams cannot solve on their own. If there's something that can be done within a department or a team by themselves, then they should just, just do it, right? They, they don't have to come and ask the lab to do it. So the whole point of having a lab is to solve the high, hardest problems that are just too disruptive to be solved within the departments themselves. Okay, I see. We have time for a final question. Uh, so in your opinion, how many pension funds are ready to adopt a lab like yours? And is there any major uh, corporate governance changes that need to happen first to make that possible? Whether that's we're talking about Canada, we're talking about the US, or we're talking about around the world. So actually there are quite a few funds uh, that already have labs similar to ours. Um, um, 
and in fact, just asset manager, like, for, like just investors in general, right? For example, I know GIC in Singapore has a lab. I know BlackRock has a lab. And and there are differences in the operating models because everyone has sort of like a unique, uh, like they have a different mandate, then they have a unique advantage, and there's a, there are certain things they're trying to solve for. So, so, so I would say that actually there are a lot of teams already have this. They may not call it a lab, they may call it something else, but you know, they already have something like this. I would say for those that don't have it, more, to answer the question, what needs to happen? I think again, it just goes back to one of the one of the topics we we, we I, I covered early or during the mid part of the presentation is like, what are the ingredients you need to to make this happen? Is like you need leadership, you need a culture, you need leadership support, you need a culture where taking risks is okay, and you need um, obviously like a talent and you know and, and a few other things along with it, right? Like success metrics and stuff. Uh, so I like I don't think. And again, you know, this is there isn't any radical governance change or anything needed because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is increase or accelerate the value of the fund, which is to generate returns for the benefit of Canadians. So, right, like, so, and there are different levers to do that, and this is just one of the many strategies we're employing to do that. All right. Thank you for this final answer. So, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, Rahil, I just want to thank you on behalf of the MIPC team and everyone here. Uh, that was a great presentation. I uh, personally, I'll leave this with uh, knowing more than I did before coming here. Uh, to everyone in the audience, uh, thank you for showing up. Tomorrow we have another uh, presentation and we have semifinals and finals later this week. So good day, everyone. Thank you.